The Seattle Sports Concussion Program is honored to welcome Dr. Robert Cantu, a friend and mentor, as a matter of fact, a man whose name is almost synonymous with the management of sports concussion. Dr. Cantu has been at the Emerson Hospital in Boston, where he also is a um, professor in the Department of Neurosurgery at Boston University in North Carolina. With Kevin, uh, Bob does run the National Center for the Study of Catastrophic Injury in Sport. And recently, uh, he has opened and now co-medical directs the Center for the Study of Traumatic Encephalopathy. This will be the focus of Dr. Cantu's talk, this critically important and current issue. Dr. Cantu uh, has been a source of leadership and insight for many of us uh, between his publications, 333 peer-reviewed articles, his lectures, and his national and international presence. He has made us all better in our understanding and management of sports concussions. Bob? It's a real thrill for me to share this day with Stan and his fellow staff members who have given a very excellent setting uh, to what we're going to be talking about. Um, the short-term risks in managing a concussion improperly, which basically means allowing the athlete to go back before all of their symptoms have cleared, if they're neuropsychologically studied, which I personally prefer to do after all symptoms have cleared and after their neurological exam is normal. It also should be back to baseline or above. But if somebody goes back before the concussion has completely recovered, they're at risk for worsening their symptoms just by the physical exertion of the activity, even if they don't take further blows. And they're also at risk if they get another concussion for now having that concussion have very prolonged recovery period. In fact, perhaps as long as months, uh, putting them in the post-concussion <laughs> syndrome uh, situation. The second thing they're at risk for is the second impact syndrome, and I'll briefly share a little bit of information about that. The long-term risks of mismanaging a concussion is the prolonged post-concussion syndrome where people now have symptoms for months if not years, and chronic traumatic encephalopathy, which is the major thrust uh, that Stan asked me to talk about today. Before I get underway, though, I wanted to say that one of the myths about concussions is necessarily that your concussions are going to get progressively worse. Those of us that see a lot of concussions, Stan can tell you, each concussion is unique, and you can't necessarily say the first one is going to be worse than the second. This young forward for the, the Bruins took five months to recover from his first concussion and two weeks to recover from his second. So that you, you can't just think that each one is necessarily going to be worse. He also reminds me of a plea that I have. I've been a part of the three international consensus guidelines uh, Vienna, Prague, and, and Zurich, and mostly because of political difficulties with regard to getting around what grading system you would use, which came up mostly in Vienna. It's been the wisdom of the group to basically get out of the grading system business and just simply say, manage your concussion, and yes, it can be managed without using a grading system, and I don't think a grading system is essential, but some kind of document should be prepared that says how long the symptoms lasted with each of those concussions. Because concussions are not equated equally. This guy's concussion that took five months to clear is not the same thing as the one that took two weeks to clear or the same one that somebody had symptoms for for 24 hours. And much of the literature, unfortunately, talks about numbers of concussions, but almost none of it talks about the severity of those concussions. And without knowing the severity, I feel personally that literature is very difficult uh, to interpret. So I would leave you with those two brief thoughts. With regard to the second impact syndrome, because of an in interest of time, I'm going to go through some of this a little quickly because it's not the major thrust of the talk. We all know that that's a situation where somebody is impacted 
has post-concussion symptoms, goes back before those post-concussion symptoms have cleared, and then has another concussion. And as a result of that, you can have not only the results of the ionic and neurotransmitter rapid releases and fluxes of the potassium out of cells and calcium into cells that kind of create the metabolic crisis that goes on uh, with concussion, but you can have as a result of it a loss of autoregulation when that second hit is taken so that vascular engorgement of blood vessels largely in the arteriolar level happens in the brain and it happens very rapidly. It happens usually within minutes. It happens more rapidly than even an epidural hematoma that normally takes 15 to 30 minutes to become sizable enough to produce rapid deterioration. So that it's a, it's a very unique phenomenon, a very worrisome phenomenon. The symptoms from the first incident are just simply the post-concussion symptoms, but the situation with that second hit is a precipitous deterioration with increased intracranial pressure because of the vascular congestion that leads to brain herniation, which in turn translates into coma, um, ocular fixed dilated pupils, and respiratory embarrassment. It's a very precipitous on the field uh, occurrence. The classical second impact syndrome involves this massive brain swelling due to vascular engorgement. We're in the process of reporting 10 cases of a very thin sliver of subdural hematoma in association with this vascular engorgement. The second impact syndrome can occur with only one hemisphere vascularly engorged, and that vascular engorgement can happen with a thin sliver of subdural. This is a picture of a typical subdural hematoma over here, where the size of the hemispheres are pretty much equal and the shift is pretty much proportional to the thickness of the subdural. That's a very different phenomenon than the second impact syndrome with a thin subdural, where the subdural is thin, the brain is markedly swollen on the side of the subdural, and the shift is much more proportional to the hyperemia in the brain than it is the mass effect of that very thin uh, subdural hematoma. With a vascular engorgement, typically on the CAT scan, there is not loss of gray matter, white matter differentiation initially, and it's a different phenomenon than if this uh, swelling were to have been due to cytotoxic edema. And schematically, basically, what we're showing in this situation is this massively swollen hemisphere with a thin sliver of subdural. We've been involved with Fred Mueller in the National Center for Catastrophic Sports Injury Research. He's the director of it. And since 87, we served as his medical director. And I will tell you that I believe a number of cases through the years which have gone down as subdural hematoma deaths were almost certainly, though we'll never be able to prove it because we can't go back, we don't have the CAT scans to look at, uh, as, were really second impact situations. Situations where the athletes uh, were playing symptomatic from an initial injury and then incurred uh, this second subdural. What I can tell you is that when we did look a couple of years ago at the experience with catastrophic brain injury in the sport of football, we found that in 38% of the cases of catastrophic injury, the athlete was playing symptomatic with a head injury that same season. So the amount of players that are playing out there with post-concussion <laughs> symptoms, unfortunately, is unacceptably high. And whenever we talk about the incidence of concussion in a given sport, it's very important to understand we're talking about reported incidents. That isn't, that, that, that isn't the real incidence. A sport like 
uh, soccer where it's continuous and on the go and you can't really be staggering about and trying to figure out what you're doing without being recognized as being off is very different from football where you're basically mostly active for four or five seconds and then stand around for 30. You can play through mild concussions in football and probably as much as 50, 60, maybe even 70 percent of mild concussions in football may honestly be missed. Uh, this is just simply another uh, picture of the uh, vascular engorgement. In, in this case, the uh, brain stem uh, is markedly displaced and the basal cisterns are filled because the brain is herniating because of the vascular engorgement, and yet there is preservation of gray-white matter differentiation. All right, long-term effects of mismanaging a concussion prolonged post-concussion syndrome, and chronic traumatic encephalopathy. This gentleman first described it, Harrison Martlin. He described it in an article in JAMA in 1928, and he was describing boxers. At the time, he was a full-time pathologist and coroner uh, in a Newark City hospital, and he was reporting dementia pugilistica in boxers. So the earliest reports of chronic traumatic encephalopathy were reports involved in boxers. Recently, uh, Sports Legacy Institute, which is a not-for-profit uh, organization uh, co-founded by Chris Nowinski, a former Harvard football player and WWE wrestler, and myself, partnered with Boston University to uh, start the Center for the Study of Traumatic Encephalopathy. And the players there are most importantly Anne McKee, who is the Director of Neuropathology, and she is the person that really looks at the brains in her lab, is the one that really does the sectioning of them and so on. Other members of the Center include Bob Stern, who is the co-director of the Alzheimer's Disease Center, um, at Boston University, and Chris Nowinski, the co-founder of, the, of um, Sports Legacy. The goal uh, of the um, center is to study the long-term effects of sports-related brain trauma, and the center basically has three arms. One is the establishment of a brain donation registry in which current or retired athletes, with or without a history of concussion, have agreed to donate their brains and so we prospectively interview them and carry out yearly assessments mostly by phone and then ultimately uh, when they die their brains will be studied. And recently in the last year Lofa Tatupu, Matt Burke uh, among others donated their brains. These are active Pro Bowl players. Sean Moria was the third um, and They've encouraged other active NFL players to donate brains. Right now, we have over 300 uh, mostly retired athletes that have donated their brains to the center when they die and are therefore being prospectively followed. The second arm of the center is to study prospectively uh, in-depth athletes uh, with comprehensive neurologic assessments, neuropsychological assessments, a variety of imaging studies using the technologies you've heard about today, as well as also genetic uh, studies on them and also looking for markers that may or may, may not be useful in diagnosing chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Unfortunately, today as I stand here, tragically the diagnosis can only be confirmed when someone dies and their brain is studied with special immunostains, which I'll show you in a moment. You can get a clinical suspicion that somebody's on the way to CTE by a clinical triad of dementia, depression, and irrational emotional behavior, but the final diagnosis requires examining their brain. We hope through these studies in the longitudinal research and an R01 grant that's been put in for, uh, which if funded, we will be able to uh, answer the question of who may be on the way to it or who has it in people that are still alive and then hopefully uh, interventions uh, can occur. We've also created a brain bank uh, through the center uh, 
uh, for uh, the depositing of brain and spinal cords because some amyotrophic lateral sclerosis is traumatically induced. And I'll show you some spinal cords in the, in the virtue of uh, these other slides where you'll be able to see that. If you're interested in wanting a primer course on what traumatic encephalopathy is, I would suggest this uh, article in the Journal of Neuropathology and Experimental Neurology. Uh, Anne McKee was the first author uh, and did the yeoman work. This, this article summarizes the then reported 52 cases in the world's literature uh, as of the time of the writing of this article. Uh, subsequently, there have been a number of other cases reported, and now as people are more interested in this entity, uh, I would expect there will be quite a few more cases uh, in the immediate future. Chronic traumatic encephalopathy, in terms of who was in that article, most of the cases were in boxers. There were at that time five football players, there are now 12. There was a professional wrestler, there are now several. And there was a soccer player and subsequently uh, a um, national, football, uh, national uh, professional hockey league player has been added. 90% in the world's literature at that time were athletes, 10% were non-athletes. Obviously all this stuff is hugely underreported. This group, I'm sure, is big and I would predict it's a public health problem. The brain doesn't know whether it's being banged around as Kevin showed you in that nice illustration from trauma on an athletic field or from trauma from other situations. Uh, of these very few cases that were not involving uh, ath athletes, uh, physical abuse, this is actually a battered wife syndrome here, head banging in an autistic child a circus clown that got shot out of a cannon and every time he got shot out he got concussed, and an epileptic that had quite a bit of head trauma. Well, obviously, this hasn't been looked at in, the, in people when they die. So if you were to have examined uh, brains and examined them with the special immunohistal uh, stains that are necessary to pick up CTE, I'm sure there are thousands upon thousands of cases uh, out there. Um, so although it's commonly found in, in athletes, it is certainly found in other individuals and of course this is a huge area of current concern especially with the multiple blast injuries that so many of our um, soldiers, male and female, are now being subjected to. This center is partnering with the VA in studying a group of individuals uh, at risk uh, for both post-traumatic stress disorder diagnosis as well as traumatic uh, brain damage as a result of blast injuries. Um, most of the symptoms of CTE do not happen when the individual is still playing their sport. Most of them happen 10, 15, 20 years later and in our series, the mean onset was 43 years of age. The one sport where you see a fairly significant, roughly a third um, of their participants having symptoms, early symptoms of CTE while still participating is the sport of boxing, where it's not rare that people in their 30s uh, with that activity uh, can show uh, early CTE symptoms. Um, the athlete that have a long latent period, typically because of that long latent period, somebody who has had a very high concussion history, for instance, a uh, Troy Aikman or a Steve Young, that right now are functioning at, as far as we know, a very high level, you still have to worry about what that problem may be uh, for those individuals uh, at a later point in their life. It's also important to understand that with this entity of CTE, it's not as simple as how many concussions somebody has had and then connecting the dots. It seems much more 
related to total brain trauma. So that throws in all those subconcussive blows. And when Kevin gave you the history of 700 to 900 significant impacts over an average year playing football, um, you can imagine what that would be if that individual played football 15, 20 years, which not is, is not at all unusual for a professional footballs that have had players that have had a significant uh, career. The symptoms of CTE start, the most prominent are cognitive, and the first is usually mild cognitive impairment, just simply forgetting why you went into a room, what, what you went in there for, going to the store, not remembering uh, what you were going to get. And then it's progressive over time to frank dementia, which by definition is just cognitive impairment to the point where you need somebody as custodial care for you. Personality changes, um, the most important of them are depression, but there are other personality changes that go on. Many of the individuals, if it's temporal lobe tip damage, will have lack of impulse control, difficulty with controlling uh, aggressive emotional uh, behaviors. Um, the mood changes, as I said, depression is head of the list. Many of them will have delusional or paranoid uh, ideation and irritability is extremely common. How do you recognize CTE? Well, we've already let that cat out of the bag. You suspect it while people are living. You know if they've got it after they die and their brains have been studied. Before we talk and show you those pictures, though, I want you to realize that the brain bounces around inside the skull and the temporal lobes are confined in this middle cranial fossa, which is rough, as is the undersurfaces where the frontal lobes rest in the frontal fossa. And as the brain bangs forward back and forth from these blows and oscillates around from the rotatory forces, the undersurfaces of the frontal lobe and the temporal lobes take a particularly um, greater burden. And the majority of the trauma that is associated with um, chronic traumatic encephalopathy involves the medial portions of the temporal lobe. The entorhinal cortex, perirhinal cortex, uh, involves the amygdala and the hippocampus regions. If you look at the pathology of CTE, this is a normal brain. The first thing that you'll see in most of these individuals is some degree of cerebral atrophy, but it will be very disproportionate for the temporal lobe. Look at the robust temporal lobe here and it, how much brain tissue has been lost as that should be out like so. It's common the cavum septum pellucidum is seen. There should not be a slit. That should be a a tight closed area and the third ventricle is often uh, enlarged due to atrophy in the thalamic and hypothalamic uh, regions. If you stain a normal brain for tau protein, immunohistochemical uh, staining, this is what you should see, no tau. This, by the way, is a special immunostain for tau. You have to use that stain. If you stain a brain with just regular hematoxyl and eosin staining, you're going to miss chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Um, so just a regular brain stain won't pick this up. What you will see in individuals with chronic traumatic encephalopathy is that tau will be deposed mostly in the second and third layers of the cerebral cortex at the bottom of sulci and disproportionately in the medial temporal lobe area. Also, you'll see it will be de deposited often in the thalamus and the mammillary bodies will characteristically be atrophic. It often, not infrequently, can be seen in the midbrain, 
medulla and even in the spinal cord and a subcategory of chronic traumatic encephalopathy um, is really traumatic amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. There have been a number of cases where the amyotrophic lateral sclerosis is felt to be due uh, to uh, traumatic uh, damage to the individual and this tau protein deposition as a result. The pattern of involvement in the brain is different with chronic traumatic encephalopathy than it is with Alzheimer's disease. So you can distinguish uh, fairly easily um, the second and third layers of the cortex are preferentially uh, involved with chronic traumatic encephalopathy. With Alzheimer's, it's the fifth or most basal layer of the cortex. It's typically perivascular. It's typically patchy. Um, at the bottom of the sulcus is where it's usually uh, most deposited. Those are all distinctions from Alzheimer's disease. Here's Alzheimer's over here with the majority of the tau down in the depths of the fifth layer. Not so here, it's up in the second and third layers. It's more superficial. Also with chronic traumatic encephalopathy, there is not normally amyloid deposition, which is a hallmark for Alzheimer's disease. Uh, the amyloid plaques can occur occasionally, but they're quite minimal when they do occur, and they're often not there at all. In the NFL, the first three cases of chronic traumatic encephalopathy involved Mike Webster, Terry Long, and Andre Waters, and these three cases were recognized by a neuropathologist by the name of Bennett Amalo, and he's the first uh, neuropathologist or first person, period, to have recognized this entity in National Football League players. He didn't recognize the entity of chronic traumatic encephalopathy, but he recognized it occurring in retired, or in this case deceased and retired NFL players. And all these players had major depressive issue, major cognitive troubles, um, emotional difficulties, um, and in two of these cases, uh, Terry Long and Andre Waters, these individuals took their own lives. The fourth reported case uh, was Justin Strelzik, who arguably took his own life by going down the wrong way of a highway at very high speeds, over 100 miles an hour, and colliding with an 18-wheeler. Um, when his brain was studied, it had extensive uh, involvement with chronic traumatic encephalopathy. In the first seven players that were studied at the center at BU, um, the majority of these individuals were linemen or linebackers, and they had a very low number of recorded diagnosed concussions. But they sustained on almost every play a hit to their head. So their subconcussive load was very, very high. So although a quarterback may get clocked occasionally by the old rules, not by the new ones, unless he runs, um, he may sustain five or six, seven concussions, but has very little trauma in between them to the brain and probably is at significantly less risk for developing chronic traumatic encephalopathy than somebody else who may have fewer recognized concussions, but on every play is taking violent hits to the head. First one, uh, one of the early uh, individuals we studied at the center was John Grimsley, a linebacker uh, with the Dolphins. Uh, John unfortunately met um, an early death when he um, accidentally self-inflicted a gun wound. Now we say accidentally because that's what the uh, medical examiner said. John made his living running a hunting lodge uh, and over the uh, last five years of his life had severe difficulties with memory, concentration, judgment, and uh, also wound up uh, being depressed. His brain is shown here. 
and it shows extensive uh, involvement with the tau protein deposition in characteristic uh, locations, medial temporal lobe being most prominently. Next one we studied uh, was Tom McHale. Tom uh, was a defensive lineman at Cornell, um, played for three different NFL teams under uh, a very fine career. Um, when he retired, he initially operated a number of successful businesses, um, but at the age of 40, um, started to experience difficulties uh, that ultimately led to uh, problems with depression, um, irrational emotional behavior, poor judgment. He also was involved with drugs and when mixing um, cocaine as well as amphetamines, got the mixture wrong and, and died, unfortunately. His brain showed, again, extensive involvement uh, with this abnormal tau protein deposition. These are what are called the neurofibrillary tangles. It's tau protein. It's a protein that can occur in your brain normally, but when it takes on a hyperphosphylated form, it becomes toxic and it kills neurons and it kills axons and over time leads to atrophy as those structures um, fall away. And in his case, we see it in the frontal lobe, we see it in the hippocampus, we see it in the temporal lobe and medulla as well. Walter Hildenberg uh, was a little bit older. Uh, when he died, he had a very lengthy career with the Minnesota Vikings, fairly high number uh, of recognized uh, concussions. Toward the end of his life, over the last uh, 10 years or so, nine years, he had progressive difficulty with cognitive uh, problems, mark worsening of organizational skills, mark memory loss, quite apathetic, quite changed in his personality. Um, his brain, when it was looked at, uh, showed evidence of contusion of the frontal areas of his brain. Most of the brains that have been studied have shown no external evidence uh, of any brain trauma. When his brain was looked at, um, there was evidence for brain atrophy with enlarged ventricles. Um, he had a cavum septum pellucidum and also significant enlargement of the third ventricle due to the thalamic hypothalamic uh, uh, atrophy as well. And again, when stained, the medial temporal lobe uh, showed the greatest amount of tau protein deposition, though it was present uh, as well in the frontal lobes uh, of his brain and his brain stem. Lewis Creekmer was 82 years old when he died, so we're moving up in terms of somebody who, who lived a fairly lengthy life. Um, 17 years uh, in football, 10 as a pro, high number of concussions. Um, retired from football at age 31, was productive for a number of years, but as early as um, 49, uh, so we're dealing with 23 years before he was to die, he was noted to have a change in his personality uh, with difficulty controlling um, frustrating situations uh, with aggressive, violent outbursts. Significant memory problems followed that, followed by depression. Eventually, he developed Parkinsonian-like uh, gait um, and died at age 82, but was quite symptomatic for the last 23 years of his life. His brain is uh, quite extremely abnormal with a great degree of ventricular enlargement. Um, again, a, a septum, cavum septum pellucidum. This is something that is very well recognized in boxers, uh, and now we're seeing it in NFL football players who have retired huge third ventricle due to volume loss of brain tissue on either side of it. Um, cavum, we've already mentioned. 
the medial temporal lobes, this should fill out like this. And it, instead, it's concave in due to the mark loss uh, of brain tissue um, uh, in that area. Uh, these uh, individuals, characteristically, the mammillary bodies, which should look like peas in this area, quite well formed, are characteristically atrophied uh, as well. The substantia nigra is a basal ganglia, which is uh, controlling and modulating uh, movement. And characteristically, Parkinson's syndrome uh, is the uh, sine qua non for people that have fallout of the substantia nigra. They should be black. Uh, it, there's great pallor there. The lack of those cells being there is what gives rise to Parkinsonian-like syndrome, the bradykinesia of not being able to initiate movement, rigidity, spasticity, and the typical Parkinson tremor uh, that is not always uh, necessarily a part of Parkinsonism. We're finding in chronic traumatic encephalopathy individuals pallor in this area. This is what we think is producing the difficulties with uh, Muhammad Ali, and if his brain were to be studied, we would expect to find great pallor uh, in that area. This is just simply showing the really incredibly intense tau protein deposition in the medial temporal lobe area of his brain, much more so than in other parts of his brain, also the midbrain as well. In the interest of, of your time, we'll go on next to Mike Borich. This is the youngest individual that we studied. Uh, this individual was a wide receiver in college. Um, he received a fairly high number of concussions uh, throughout his football career. After college, he became a coach. He did not play professionally. Uh, as young as the age of 38, he started to develop a change in his personality. Again, the typical temporal lobe issues with inability to handle frustrating situations instead going on to violent outbursts. Uh, this led to drug and alcohol abuse. And when he died as a result of that abuse, um, not the most dense, but nonetheless very, very abnormal uh, tau protein deposition, medial temporal lobe, depths of sulci in the frontal lobe uh, were seen. Um, these are just simply a number of individuals that have been studied at the center showing that typical tau protein deposition, medial temporal lobe more so than frontal lobe, but it is also uh, deposited in the brain stem as well. This is a really, really concerning issue. This 18-year-old young man had two concussions playing football, two concussions playing rugby. He died of a rugby injury. Um, his mother said that he was a hyperactive kid his whole life and just stuck his head into everything and every sport he played, whether it's basketball or football or whatever, he was, he was going head first into. When his brain was studied, it shows abnormal tau protein deposition in two perivascular locations. There should be no tau protein deposition in any 18-year-old individual. This individual was not symptomatic of traumatic encephalopathy, but obviously had early incipient tauopathy, tau protein deposition. And if he'd gone on to play competitive sports, took more head trauma, this probably would have progressed and he probably would have become symptomatic at a later day. Raises big concerns. Kevin kind of broached this about youngsters taking trauma, significant trauma, um, quite young, and then their exposure being so great if they start taking significant head injury or a lot of repetitive head injury quite early. Um, this is the earliest case, but we are, over time, I'm sure, going to have other, uh, unfortunately, uh, young people that come to be studied. Um, so if it's happened in one, I'm sure it's happened in others. This just simply is the uh, perivascular location of this very dense tau protein 
deposition. Recently, we've been involved, as have others, uh, with testifying uh, before the judiciary about the incidence of head trauma and, and, and uh, damage as a result of it. And, and kind of my thrust that day was this problem is, is uh, in football, yes, but it's a much bigger public health issue because there's no reason in the world to think it's unique to football. And in fact, as we talked about, the athletes and other sports that are involved um, and the fact that this, I'm sure, is out there in society in significant amounts, uh, people that have had repetitive head injury. Um, at that time, though, the National Football League uh, was not acknowledging that there was a connection between repetitive head injury uh, and this late life or later life chronic traumatic encephalopathy. And Commissioner Goodell, to his wisdom, said when asked these questions, uh, ask the S experts and let them give a better answer. And I'm very pleased that the NFL, a very short while later, several weeks later, kind of changed their stance and did indeed say there is a connection between trauma that can be delivered to the head playing football. Uh, we actually have a case in a high school individual age 18. We have another case of chronic traumatic encephalopathy in a college player that didn't play NFL. So some individuals, even before they get to the NFL, may have or be on the way to CTE. They may not have gotten it all at, uh, at, at the NFL level. So I think the recognition of the problem is huge on the part of the National Football League. I think the National Football League also has gotten a little bit of a bum rap in the sense that it's all been pretty much negative that's been portrayed of them in the media, and that's really not quite fair. You heard Kevin show you um, and talk to you about the fact that the majority or a disproportionate number of traumatic injuries happen to football players during the kickoff and the punt returns. In the National Center for Catastrophic Sports Injury Research, per minute of play, the highest risk thing you can do is be on the opening kickoff. It doesn't make the highest number of injuries, but per minute individuals are involved. And it's obviously because people are coming at each other from higher speeds. The NFL, to their wisdom, and they didn't get credit for this, or much that I heard, took out the three-man wedge um, in terms of returning kicks. Two people can block for the returner but the th third person is not. And there used to be a person whose job was just simply going down the field, breaking up that wedge. And Kevin Everett, a couple of years back, broke up his neck in the process and was quadruparetic for a period of time, fortunately largely recovered. The neck and, and head trauma that was involved with that wedge formation is now long, largely a thing of the past. The crackback block cannot be delivered to the head. It's now a penalizable offense. If an individual uses their helmet to drill somebody else and that individual doesn't see the hit coming, that's also a penable uh, offense. And I hope that in the years ahead, uh, we will see deliberate use of the head in blocking and tackling uh, outlawed uh, as well. And going back more to the the types of techniques that were used in the 50s and 60s when football stadiums were still uh, completely filled. So finally, what do we know and what do we need to do further? We know that some individuals are susceptible to chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Tragically, of the 12 brains, 13 brains that we have studied of ex-NFL players that have died, Every single one has had traumatic encephalopathy except one who was 24 years old and played one year in the NFL. That obviously doesn't mean the incidence is that high, but it's worrisome uh, in terms of those individuals, that subset who were symptomatic, whose brains became available and we studied them, um, have shown it. So it is something that we don't know the prevalence of right now. We don't know the incidence, but it, it's, it's something we've got to get our hands uh, on. The triad you've heard 
It's basically cognitive impairment progressively getting worse, dementia, uh, and irrational emotional behavior, and lack of impulse control. And by the way, that lack of impro uh, impulse control, which is a medial temporal lobe function, is very much connected to addictive behaviors in general. So it's not a surprise that a lot of these individuals with CTE did have addictive behaviors, and some of them were addicted uh, to various uh, substances. CTE has been reported now in most types of activity that involve head trauma. Boxing still leads the list for, I think, obvious reasons, because the number of subconcussive blows uh, is certainly highest uh, in that sport. Many more issues, I think, need further investigation, and I'm sure we'll have better answers to it, I hope, soon. How much and what type of head trauma is causative? It's possible that all types are. Are young players more susceptible? Are some individuals more susceptible than others? We certainly would expect this. And are there genetic risk factors? And what are other risk factors? These are all things that are being studied currently, all questions that are, at this point in time, uh, is, is just that. Again, to be redundant, I really want to stress that the CTE appears related to total subconcussive and concussive brain trauma. So it's related to total brain trauma, not just number of concussions. Characteristically, there's this latent period, especially in the sports, which don't have as much brain trauma as does uh, boxing. And then once triggered, unfortunately, this uh, entity runs a progressive downhill course, uh, which presently there is no treatment known for, but we hopefully will be able to have interventions uh, in the not too distant future. In the advanced cases of CTE, unquestionably, right now, the majority of them are being misdiagnosed as Alzheimer's disease because so many of the features are similar. But if their brains are able to be studied, there are absolute concrete differences neuropathologically uh, which can be seen to distinguish between those two entities. To the credit of the NFL, when I met with Commissioner Goodell a few months ago and asked if a plea could be made that individuals that are in the John Mackey, the 88 club, the NFL, uh, to their credit, funds a, uh, basically a medical plan for individuals that have dementia, that have played in the NFL. There's no cause and effect necessarily involved to be able to receive those payments. And those payments are for their uh, caregiver situation, whether it be just somebody in their own home or whether these people are institutionalized. These individuals, we think, will be shown, if their brains can be studied, uh, to have most likely at least in many cases, chronic traumatic encephalopathy and not truly be Alzheimer's disease uh, patients. Um, the NFL has cooperated highly uh, with trying to encourage family and significant others who are really in charge at this point of these people to donate their brains to the center and we're grateful for that. A fairly high number of these football players that we have studied have died suddenly in middle age. Uh, Lou Kriegmer in his 82 years of age is somewhat the exception. And most of these deaths have been from suicide or substance abuse, or in the case of Justin Strelzik, erratic emotional behavior. To date, all of the brains from the football players that we have studied have shown at least focal evidence of CTE. Um, there actually is one brain subsequently that has not shown CTE, and that was the NFL player, 24 years of age, uh, who played one year in the NFL. We've already 
harped on this many times over, and it's going to be very interesting as we study uh, over time when they become available, military uh, personnel. Just a brief mention that Kevin and I have uh, funded a research endowment through NADA for concussion research to fund young people on their way to master's programs and uh, PhD programs. And if anybody is uh, interested in learning more about that, we'd be very happy to pass on information. And with that, I thank you very much for your attendance. I realize it's been a really long morning, but uh, I'm very thrilled to be here, and I hope you enjoyed the talk. Thank you.